Okay. All right. Okay. Let's get started. Um, so today is my great honor to introduce today's speaker, uh, Daniel Axton. I assure most of you actually know Daniel and have talked or interacted with him. He's our own informatics person here. Uh, Daniel has been a system professor in the department since 2018, and this is the sixth year. Um, so I actually work with Daniel, and his work is in the field of personal tracking or personal informatics. And he studied this for a lot of different domains, primarily health, wellness and also uh, in clinical setting and sustainability what i heard recently um so daniel is a very productive scholar if you look at his website it's tons of papers <laughs> lots of phd students many papers have been best paper award all the board mentions and his work has been supported by the nsf and nih from the industry I do want to mention this year that Daniel actually won the most prestigious NSF award for junior faculty. It's called NSF Career Award. So that's a big career achievement. So today he's going to give an overview of his, of his research um, to think about when we design a lot of personal informatics and personal tracking tools, people do not always use it. They abandon it and they found it's not, it does not, those tools do not fit in their everyday practice or tracking experiences. So Daniel's gonna talk about his work and his students' work on how do we understand meaningful tracking experiences and how do we design technology to support such experiences. Thank you, Yuna. That was, that was a very kind introduction. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, okay, so it's getting to the point where I, I kind of no longer need this slide in my talks, but I, I kind of always start with it. Um, personal tracking is, is, is pretty ubiquitous at this point. Uh, many people are using some aspect of, of technology to monitor something about their health and well-being. Um, over 40% of people in the U.S. have tried to track their physical activity, such as through a, a smartwatch, like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, that sort of thing. Um, and the number of people who have access to tracking capabilities are even higher when you consider that, that every smartphone has access to an app store. Some even um, include... Uh, automated tracking of, of step counting and that sort of thing. But when you when you kind of open it up to the broader app store, you can enable things like people to do food journaling, menstrual tracking, whole bunch of different domains. Um, and we're now at the point where, you know, 85% of people in the US and nearly half of people worldwide have one of these devices and use them pretty regularly. Uh, and so, you know, the good news for me and my research is there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic about, about this sort of technology. Um, studies, you know, systematic reviews have kind of shown that um, when people use these sorts of wearable devices and tracking apps, they can, you know, do great things for their health and well-being, like walk more than uh, an additional 2,000 steps a day, that sort of thing. So, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunity to be hopeful. Um, but then at the same time, there's there's a reason to suggest that people just aren't getting what they want out of these sort of tracking tools. Um, and so as one measure, health and well-being apps have just a retention rate of 4% after a month. Um, lot, you know, lots for early abandonment, that sort of thing. Um, and this can fluctuate a little bit depending on the domain and the tool. But overall, there's kind of this sentiment that people just aren't getting what they want out of tracking technologies. Um, people are kind of failing to derive value from the tracking technologies. Um, and while these tools do work for some people, this is this has been kind of a common refrain in the research community. Uh, so as a field tasked with understanding how we should go about designing these technologies, it's up to us to understand, uh, you know, what it is about these technologies and the settings that they're embedded in um, are leading people to fail to derive value. Um, and the research community has kind of pointed to a whole bunch of different reasons that tracking is burdensome, tracking isn't helping people get support from their family and friends around health and well-being, that sort of thing. It's really difficult to make this sort of data clini clinically useful. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons for it. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of take a pivot on on a lot of these sorts of reasons throughout the rest of this talk. Um, and I'm gonna argue over the course of the rest of the talk that uh, today's tracking technologies don't provide meaningful engagement with data. And I'm gonna kind of unpack what I mean when I say meaning um, and, and kind of think through how we can kind of chart a path forward towards tracking technologies that are a little bit more meaningful. Um, and I really do think that there are potentials for, for designs to kind of help towards this. 
Um, so over the course of the, the next, you know, 40, 45 minutes, somewhere in that range, um, I'm first going to start by defining what I mean by meaning in tracking technology. Um, I'm then going to take a slight detour towards some people and some topics that I'm not going to get a chance to highlight over the course of the rest of the talk. Um, cause in the, in the nature of a talk, you just, you just can't highlight everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I'm going to focus on kind of two specific areas where I think we can make tracking technology more meaningful. Um, so one is kind of around connecting to people's kind of personal values through tracking flexibility. Um, and I'll unpack more what I mean by that. And I'll talk about two systems that we've been, uh, designing and thinking through for, for how we might go about doing that. Um, and then I'll talk through uh, two other systems, um, which are really designed towards uh, uh, conveying significance of moments that people track through kind of annotations. Okay, uh, so let's start by, by trying to unpack what meaning is or could look like in tracking technology. Okay, uh, so don't expect you to kind of understand the the all the details of this chart. Um, but what I what I really want to highlight, we did a systematic review a couple of years ago um, of just kind of the state of the art in research on tracking technology, um, and a core focus and kind of what most re researchers think about when they think about tracking technology um, is this idea of behavioral change, and that's kind of the thing that we should be supporting through tracking. Um, and so there's lots of ways where tracking can be helpful towards these goals. Uh, you know, someone can have a behavioral goal of trying to increase physical activity, maybe eat more balanced meals. This doesn't have to be in health and well-being, reducing unnecessary spending. There's a lot of other different domains where people uh, turn to tracking as part of, uh, uh, you know, setting up behavioral goals. Um, but what uh, I really want to highlight is that people's motivations for turning to tracking, um, particularly when you look at that long tail, are substantially more diverse than just behavioral change. Uh, people have goals like wanting to connect to others and kind of use tracking as a way to, to kind of uh, join with others around a shared interest or a shared identity. A lot of people are just tracking out of curiosity. They find this thing super fascinating. And so they turn to these sorts of devices and, and try them out in order to kind of satisfy those curiosities. Um, some people are really excited about just like record keeping and having a really detailed log of, you know, everything that they do in their life or maybe everything that they do in some particular faction or dimension of their life. Um, and then some people want to use the data that they're collecting towards creative self-expression. They want to turn it into, you know, ways that they can kind of better represent themselves to the world. Um, and supporting these sorts of motivations kind of effectively requires engagement in kind of other ways in which people define meaning from tracking. And if we, and, and I really argue that if we wanna also support those behavior change goals, we need to support kind of the, these more diverse sets of goals kind of in addition or as well. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna now take a little bit of a step back and kind of talk a little more theoretically about uh, what it means for engagement with technology to be, to be meaningful. Um, lots of researchers have thought about this a lot. There's been lots of systematic efforts to kind of categorize what a meaningful engagement with technology is. Uh, I'm going to focus on this one definition by, by Meckler and Hornbeck, um, and, and they've kind of evolved this thinking further. Um, but there's lots of others that, that kind of draw on, and on kind of similar ideas. Um, and these dimensions can get really, really philosophical. So I'm going to try my best to make them approachable and, and, and kind of relate them to uh, the context of tracking technology. Okay, um, so I think that tracking technology actually does a really good job at two of these sorts of dimensions. Um, one is around purpose and one is around coherence. And I'm going to unpack that a little bit more. Um, so purpose is this idea that people find meaning in seeing how their, their kind of individual actions are contributing towards some sort of larger goal. Um, and this kind of makes a, a lot of sense in the context of tracking technology. It's really the like goal setting part of it. Um, so if you think about an Apple Watch, uh, Apple Watch has this, this system where, where it can kind of send you a reminder uh, every hour that you haven't stood up, uh, or you haven't walked around at all during uh, over that course of that hour. Um, and then as part of that, they include a, a little interface. Some people have a, as a widget on their on their smartwatch, that sort of thing, which tells you, okay, over the course of a you know twelve hours in your day, how many times did you actually achieve that goal? Did you actually stand up in that hour um, versus doing kind of sedentary work? Um, so there's like the direct action of like standing up, and then they're seeing that actually resulting in you know the larger goal of making sure that you're doing that over the course of your day. Um, and this sort of thing that shows up in a lot of different domains, but this sort of thing is really, really common to kind of tracking technology. This idea of like goal monitoring and, and you know, kind of carrying that goal through uh, is really kind of core to what we think of when we think about tracking technology. 
Uh, and kind of the other piece, uh, coherence, is really this idea that people find meaning in kind of understanding what they're experiencing. Um, and this is largely the kind of ref reflection piece of tracking technology, where people are kind of taking data and thinking about what it means for them and thinking about what they're experiencing. This is largely taken the form of things like data visualization or planning or hypothesis testing, that sort of thing. Um, and there's been a lot of great research in a lot of different domains. I've had the luxury of working on this in, in spaces like productivity and menstrual health and, and food and a couple of other spaces. Um, and really trying to innovate on like, how can we best visualize data or make sense of data in order to kind of help people understand a little bit better. Um, and there's certainly opportunities for doing more work in this space, but I kind of argue that this is this is a thing that we that we've kind of have a little bit of a handle on as as researchers. What's left is kind of these three other dimensions uh, associated with meaning, and and I don't necessarily expect you to to pick up these definitions right now. I'll kind of unpack them over the course of the rest of this talk, but I think these three other areas um, are really what's missing when we're thinking about personal tracking. And to be clear, uh, my point isn't that we should kind of abandon the the kind of ways of of cultivating meaning that tracking technology um, is kind of already doing, but that if we really want to support these kind of holistic goals that that people have when they turn to tracking technology, we need to embrace these sorts of ideas as well. Okay, going to return to those in a second. Uh, let's highlight a couple of things, a couple people, and some topics that I really won't get a chance to highlight over the course of the rest of my talk. Uh, I think all my, my PhD students are here. I run the personal informatics everyday lab. Um, Matthew and Whitney and Dennis are over there. Uh, and Kyung or Joe and she and Lucas are over there. Um, these students have really kind of led the research that I'm gonna talk about over the course of this talk. And I'm gonna try to highlight um, where they've kind of led different efforts that I'm putting out. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm deeply thankful to, to them for, for their efforts and, and what I'm about to talk about. Um, and over the course of the past five years, I've really had the great pleasure of collaborating with many different students and faculty. I'm sure I've forgotten some names on this slide, um, but both here at UCI and kind of uh, in other institutions and some companies around the world. Uh, but but really, thank you to to all of them as part of the uh, part of their efforts. Um, and uh, just a, a couple of topics that I'm really not going to get a chance to talk about, but I think really do connect to this kind of overall vision of meaning. Um, one of the spaces that uh, she and, and some some others have gotten the, the luxury of working on um, is in, in kind of the space of pregnancy and fertility tracking. Um, we've been really examining what it means for people to ascribe meaning to kind of AI related terminology as, as it's coming in here. Like uh, if people are making predictions around, you know, when, when you might uh, have your next cycle or something like that. Um, and, and thinking about how that then um, informs kind of accuracy and trust in, in these sorts of technologies. Um, I've also been doing some work lately in public health monitoring. Um, originally, this kind of drew out of contact tracing in COVID, but more recently, we've been collaborating with uh, public health agencies in South Korea on some sort of conversational agents that they've been using uh, for older adults who are, who are living alone. Um, and here we've identified some really strong tensions between the tracking technology supporting the data collection goals of the, the kind of public health officials and public health authorities, uh, and then supporting uh, kind of the individuals who are on the other end of those conversations as feeling as though their kind of social support needs are being met through the technology. Uh, sorry, subtitle here's, here's off, um, but it's been really great to, to uh, think about more meaningful experiences and what that could look like in mental health support apps. Um, and we've recently surfaced spaces where, where mood could reduce, it could produce more meaningful tracking experiences, such as emphasizing trends or reducing rumination. Um, but we've also been looking into the space of teletherapy apps, often finding uh, that they fall short of, of kind of following the ethical principles, which traditional therapy is, is uh, subject to. Um, and as you know, mentioned, um, I'm especially thankful to the National Science Foundation for supporting my work in this area. Um, and I'm really, I'm really just at the beginning of this. Uh, they, you know, they supported me in the career grant for the next five years. So uh, I'm really excited to see where my students and I go towards identifying these ideas. Okay, uh, on to the, on to kind of the meat of the talk. Um, so let's, let's kind of unpack connectedness. Um, this idea of connectedness as it pertains to meaning is that people find meaning in relating their experiences to other values or interests that they have. Um, so maybe that's aspects of their personality or their hobbies or causes that they think are particularly important. Um, it's really kind of this idea of connecting one thing to another aspect of your life. 
Um, so what might this mean for a tracking technology? Um, so I think it's that if designs people uh, designs give people the flexibility to track what they want and express how it relates to kind of those other interests that they have, um, and then we can kind of better support this idea and this this uh, goal of connectedness. Um, and I'm going to talk about that through how we can support flexibility in presentation as well as flexibility in collection and supporting people both in presenting their kind of values alongside their tracking data as well as collecting the data that's most personally meaningful to them. Okay, uh, so let's talk about custom watch faces. Um, so kind of broadly, representations of track data have often been pretty fixed. Um, traditional per, uh, approaches in personal tracking, including ones that, that I've worked on, um, would really suggest visualizing data that answer questions that people find really interesting, uh, such as, you know, what are days when I walk the most? Or, you know, what form of transit uh, do I take most often? That sort of thing. Um, and these can certainly be useful. People derive value from these representations that, that answer the questions that they have. Um, and we see these sorts of things in commercial apps. So uh, on the left over here is a system um, that I worked on almost a decade ago now, um, where it's highlighting that, that I biked less than 5% of the time that I, I traveled around to places. Um, and we actually see these same sorts of principles of like calling out an answer to a particular question or a particular insight um, the right is from Apple Health today. Um, so we actually see a lot of those ideas coming forward. But the the design space of how we actually go and present these sorts of data um, is, is kind of uh, much larger. There's now a lot more degrees of freedom in, in how we can go about representing sort of data. It's not just bar graphs or that are answering specific questions. People also use self-tracking as part of self-expression, connecting their data to other interests and other aspects of their identity. Uh, and so, for example, Fitbit has hundreds of watch faces that you can just go to a, a, a library and choose from. Um, and they all include the data as kind of like a core component of them, but it's done kind of alongside uh, other elements. Um, and so this kind of led us to ask a core question of, of how do people actually choose to represent, represent their data when they're actually given that sort of flexibility, when they're not necessarily beholden to what app developers think are the most important insights to highlight, but when they actually get some choice about how they want to go about representing their data, how do they go about doing that? Um, and so we looked at, at watch faces that, that people are just kind of using out in the wild. We asked people to, to take a quick photo of like what's actually on your wrist right now if you're using a Fitbit um, and send it to us. And, and you know, we talked to some other people uh, about their experiences as well. Um, and we kind of found that the, that the customizations that people did, that people made kind of fell on three main axes. Um, so one is, is data, um, and this is kind of what you would expect. Uh, people customize what data their watch faces include. Some people choose really data-heavy uh, watch faces, like some of the ones that I'm talking about here, whereas other people choose much, much more data-light watch faces. Um, but kind of moving beyond that, this is sort of what you would expect in this space. Um, we also see people um, really kind of customizing the aesthetic of their watch faces. So. Uh, this is choosing colors that they really like, fonts, layouts, that sort of thing. Um, customizations that would motivate people to use their watch more for data purposes. Uh, so the one in, in kind of the top left in the middle here was someone who really wanted their goals represented by like race cars. Um, and so, you know, the, the data is actually, you know, the same as some of these ones on the left, but the, but the actual form of presentation is kind of radically different because they found it to be much more motivating to them. Um, and kind of the third axis that we saw is that people, people went really personal with their watch face designs. Um, they connected to hobbies that they had, interests that they liked, photos of their families, causes that they cared about. Um, the one in the bottom right, uh, this was someone who was actually really upset with uh, the Brexit movement and, and uh, Great Britain leaving the EU. And so they, they wanted that kind of like reminder just represented on their watch face. Um, and you see in all of these that like the data is still there. Like, you know, people are still using these sorts of devices towards, you know, monitoring their health and well-being, but they're also kind of incorporating that in kind of broader things that they care about. Um, and, and people derive a lot of joy from being able to customize their watch faces. Um, so this first participant, S140, is saying how she appreciates not only being able uh, to select based on her data needs, but also based on how it looks. Uh, not only does it have the stats on my watch face that could be customized, I picked what I wanted to be each color. So really appreciated that sort of level. Um, the, the second participant here um, 
she was really highlighting that she loved this particular wash face. It was Halloween at the time. It fit right in with her tattoos, which, you know, if you know anything about tattoos, that's usually something that people are doing because it's, you know, it's something, whatever they're getting a tattoo of is kind of deeply uh, meaningful to them. Uh, and then she might update her watch face if she gets new ones. Um, people would also kind of pair them with their clothes, uh, you know, what they were wearing, the weather outside, that sort of thing. And they would use it as like uh, much more of an accessory. Um, but moreover, these kind of personal customizations also drive interest and motivation and kind of tracking to be active. Um, so we actually see these sorts of customizations and furthering those sorts of behavior change goals that people often uh, kind of think about conventionally when they think about tracking. Uh, so this first example, this was a person who had a picture of their grandchildren on their watch face. It helps them get up and move. Uh, seeing them makes me uh, try to move a bit long, uh, a bit more and be stronger so that I can spend more time with them. It's like a persistent reminder to try to get up. Um, so we really see that association between kind of the personal meaning and the behavior goal. Uh, second person said, big Spider-Man here. It really helps me enjoy my Fitbit a lot. Sometimes I even feel a bit heroic when, when I'm getting really active. Uh, so they're seeing that kind of parallel between their, their personal interests and, you know, comics and that sort of thing and their, their desire for kind of broader health and well-being. Uh, and more recently, we've been playing around with designing tools that enable people uh, to make these sort of customized watch faces so they're not quite as dependent on what's available in watch face galleries and can kind of tailor them to their design and aesthetic needs. Um, and this project is still ongoing. Um, this is this is a video of what uh, Matthew and, and some others have been designing around Watch Me. Um, Matthew's happy to, to share more details or talk to you more about this sort of project. But we were truly really trying here to separate out uh, kind of customization around data from uh, layout and aesthetic and kind of separate out these dimensions so that people could, could kind of over time build out a, a watch face that's really matching their, their individual needs. Okay, uh, so now I'm going to transition over to kind of flexibility in um, collecting data. Um, I'm going to switch domains here. Um, this is in the area of food journaling, um, which if you know much about food journaling, food journaling is uh, particularly burdensome. If you've ever tried to keep track of what you're eating in a day, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and so in the, the research literature, we kind of thought about approaching food journaling through kind of two separate ways. Um, one, um, which you can see in the example on the left, this is my plate. This is actually a, a US government sponsored app. Um, one approach, which is really common is, is the, the calorie counting sort of approach, really quantitative, really metrics driven, trying to have like a really holistic log of everything that you're eating and you know measuring your intake. Um, the other approach tends to be much more uh, holistic and, and kind of focused on, um, uh, focused on a much more qualitative way of making sense of your food. Um, this is kind of best exemplified by apps like 8, which are really photo-based. Um, you can also think about this if you just go to Instagram and take photos of your food. That's kind of a, a much more qualitative way of, you know, you get some kind of peripheral understanding of what you're eating, but it's not quite as, you know, regimented. It's not quite as, uh, you know, goal and then, you know, did you achieve that goal or not? Um, and these, these kind of techniques are used both kind of widely commercially as well as in research. Um, but one thing that we kind of see when we when we kind of take a step back is that these systems are kind of largely setting up these two sorts of approaches as as uh, kind of in tension with one another. You kind of you have a choice at the point when you go to an app store. Do you want like a really calorie based approach, and you know do you, do you want to be monitoring with that sort of goal in mind, or do you want to take a more holistic approach where you're kind of uh, removing those sorts of uh, numbers away? Um, and you're instead kind of focused on the more, more holistic qualities of the food that you're eating. Um, but people are more complicated than that. Uh, what people find meaningful or valuable at a particular moment varies, and therefore what they wish to, to collect varies, or at least that was kind of our hypothesis going into this project. Um, so Lucas was leading this work. This was called Mod Eat. Um, this was a system where uh, we just kind of supported a lot of different entry modalities at once. Um, we also supported a lot of different devices. I'm not going to really talk about the devices here. Um, but the kind of core idea behind this was kind of letting people situationally choose what input method was uh, most meaningful to them at a given time. Um, so as part of that, they could choose to do everything from scan a barcode uh, of, a, of a food that they were eating to 
uh, make a calorie-based data entry to taking a photo to just describing it in kind of plain text or, or in a verbal description. We had a lot of different options there for, for kind of uh, spanning the range of different uh, data which people could collect around, around food. Um, and so not going to get into the details of it. There's a lot in this graph. Don't expect you to understand it all or, or, or read it all really quickly. Um, but there's kind of two main takeaways. Um, the first is that, that as you would kind of expect, people's, what people actually tracked aligned really closely with kind of their original motivation for tracking. So people who had those kind of more holistic awareness sorts of goals, they tended to use things like open-ended text descriptions, photos, that sort of thing a lot more often. Whereas people who had weight loss or calorie counting goals tended to, to use those, those uh, much more rigorous methods of entry, like database searches or barcode scanning, that sort of thing. And kind of at a big sense, that's, that's what we were seeing. Um, but if you look at just kind of the number of colors in this sort of graph, you see a lot of variance in there. Um, so it's not necessarily that people were kind of always using one of these modalities. They were, they were switching pretty regularly between uh, different modalities. Uh, and so they would do that to line with uh, values that they had maybe that were more social. So, you know, one participant highlighted, you know, that they, they really wanted to mention that this dinner was at a friend's house, for example. Um, and so that was something that they wanted to make sure was included in their entry. Um, participants also highlighted that their values kind of shifted over time. Um, so one participant said, uh, if I'm just trying to be more cognizant of what I'm eating, and I, I would actually be fine with a simpler tracking version. But if I'm actually going to do weight training, which is a goal that they kind of sometimes had that they picked up on and off, then I'm going to want to be much more granular about it. Um, and then, and then, as you expect, if you uh, if you see, uh, you know, you spend time on Instagram, for example, and you see how people kind of cultivate their food there. Um, we also saw a lot of interest in self presentation. Um, so this participant was saying that they didn't just want to list all the foods that they were consuming. Um, they thought that the presentation looked nice and they actually arranged their foods in particular to kind of highlight that aspect of what they were doing. Um, and so people not only find meaning in how they go about presenting that information, um, but even if that was just for themselves, um, it wasn't necessarily about sharing it socially, but people actually kind of thought about that as potentially useful for themselves. Um, so what I take away from all this is, is that um, we found that, that greater flexibility can kind of better help people connect with their data um, but there's really kind of a gap in the, the tool space where we need kind of better tools in order to support some aspects of this flexibility. Um, we, don't not, we don't necessarily want people to feel kind of locked into what collection options or what presentation options are available by a particular platform. Um, and we as researchers need to be thinking more about how we can go about and, and uh, supporting kind of this range of, of input and, and representation options that are available. Okay. Uh, going to kind of switch gears now um, and talk a little bit about uh, conveying significance. Um, so the idea of significance is that people find me meaning and feeling that their kind of individual actions and the, the steps that they're taking and kind of in everyday life are, are, are important to them. Um, and people often kind of know that intuitively, I think that I would argue. People, uh, people kind of feel that being uh, healthy, for example, um, is, is worthwhile and has some sort of long-term impact on kind of their overall uh, 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 meaning in the world. Um, but, they, but what they often kind of struggle to do is kind of conveying how some of the individual moments that they're tracking uh, might end up being meaningful to, to others. Um, so, you know, I might know that, you know, this run that I was, uh, that I really struggled with was, uh, you know, really impressive because, you know, of how hard it was for me to get out of bed that morning or all the other different things, or even just like taking the time to, to go and do that sort of exercise. But I often have a lot of hard times going and conveying that to other people. Um, and so, so what we were really looking at in this space and what, what I'm, going to try to argue here is that designs can really assist people in better communicating that significance, um, but they often do so in kind of conveying the importance of data and actually de-emphasizing the data for itself. So kind of either annotating uh, the significance of the data or actually using the, the, the data as, as a piece of annotation itself. Um, so let me talk through what I mean by that. Um, so, so in kind of the two projects I'm going to talk through, one is really in the, in the much more social space where the annotation is actually happening through the data. 
where uh, the data is actually being used to annotate other things that people are doing. And then, then in the other, I'm going to talk about how, particularly in clinical settings, if we annotate the data with a little bit more context or a little bit more meaning, um, we can better kind of achieve clinical benefit. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit in the social space. So people are taking the sort of tracking that we see in all these sorts of apps and, and going and sharing them online on social media, for example, in order to get kind of social support, uh, advice, that sort of thing. Um, when things are going well, and don't expect you to, to dig into the details of this, this diagram, you can ask she more if you have uh, specific questions about it. Um, but when this goes well, people move data from tracking technology to social uh, technologies as part of getting support, sharing insights, that sort of thing. And then people then apply the knowledge from those social technologies back to their use of tracking technologies, uh, like getting advice for where to go running and walking, what foods to eat, that sort of thing. So there's kind of this, this symbiotic relationship between how tracking technology and social technology uh, can kind of support people, particularly in, in these kind of health and well-being sort of spaces. Um, but what we also see in the space is when people think about sharing, especially on social media, uh, they're really worried about that their that they're tracked insights, uh, the activities that they do, that sort of thing, celebratory moments are too trivial for their sharing audiences. Uh, their audiences aren't going to be interested. They're not going to receive this, the response or the support that they desire. Uh, they worry that their track moments are too trivial to share. Um, and so, so this kind of this kind of thought, this this idea of how can we how can we kind of allow people to share more trivial moments around data led us to the design of Snappy. Um, and Snappy was was this idea um, of what if we supported data sharing on uh, a really lightweight and ephemeral platform like Snapchat, where people uh, are sharing just kind of their mundane everyday activities. And then really kind of de-emphasize the data as part of that. It wasn't necessarily about sharing the data. You weren't making a post where you were only highlighting the data, but it was in kind of the broader everyday sorts of things that you were working on. Um, and so the core idea behind this was to make track data uh, a small piece of the kind of shared content um, and help and use that to kind of help people convey the significance um, and contextualized in their everyday sort of moments. Uh, okay, I hear, yeah, yeah. Is it uh, tracking to themselves or with an audience? It's not this is with an audience. Um, so this is people who were explicitly trying to uh, share the data, the data that they collected in, in kind of social settings. OK, uh, I'm going to show a little demo of Snappy. Mishu tells me I have to make some tweaks here. So let me get these right. That. <laughs> Upon opening the Snappy app, users can select from different data domains to share. Each domain has a variety of stickers to select from. After picking a sticker, the sticker could then be customized with options available to it. For the sneaker-shaped step sticker, the animation and target goal could be customized. For the badge sticker, color and animation were available to be customized. Snappy user could customize what data they would like to include for sharing. Snappy syncs with existing data sources for most of the domains. For example, steps data could be pulled from the iOS health kit. User could then select the time interval by selecting the time range from day, week, or months, and then select the window of the activity they wish to share. Share could customize the sticker as much as they like. After rendering complete, Snappy user could export the sticker to Snapchat. They could then take a photo shot and customize the snaps with Snapchat's built-in authoring features, such as adding stickers or captions. Okay. Um... So a couple, just a couple of things that I want to call out in the, the demo. Um, one was really the breadth of different kind of tracking capabilities that, that we were incorporating into Snappy. Um, so this wasn't just about uh, supporting sharing in one particular domain. 
Um, and then importantly, we, we were trying to support kind of a real breadth of presentation options for people. And this ended up being really important towards people uh, then using it towards those social goals. Like they wanted to be able to, you know, select a little foot when they went running or, you know, include some other object that they found to be, uh, you know, particularly motivational or meaningful for them. Uh, the, the second thing that I wanted to highlight is that we pulled uh, data from kind of existing sources. So it no longer, uh, or it didn't, you could kind of leverage where you were already doing the tracking for your own benefit. Um, we pulled from the step trackers that were on people's phones. Um, we did music listening. If you wanted to listen, you know, highlight how many times you listen to an album, that sort of thing. We could pull how many times you listen to it on Spotify, for example. Um, and then the third piece that I want to highlight is that is that uh, you weren't actually beholden to those numbers that were coming from those other sources. You could kind of add whatever you wanted. You could you could share whatever you wanted. Um, and also I'll highlight in just a second, people, you know, use these stickers to share kind of whatever they found to, to be most meaningful to them. Um, people use these stickers in all sorts of uh, playful ways and found them to be really uh, successful conversation starters. They would kind of combine them with different emoji that they had. Um, I'll highlight the example on the right here, um, which is this person who was uh, studying for, for a physics exam and found that to be really stressful. Um, and so they added a sticker that was, uh, what is that? Uh, 880 beats per minute. Um, if you know anything about heart rate, you would be dead if that was your heart rate. Um, so they were using it much more for kind of self-presentation goals for, for kind of highlighting their, their level of stress rather than anything actually about the, the data inherently itself. Um, and people would really kind of often stretch the truth in this way. Um, and so what we, what we found over the course of the study is that sharing via these sorts of annotations really help people kind of contextualize the data a little bit more. Um, so this person was saying, uh, I would hold up like my food over the sticker of a bowl because I thought it looked cute. Um, so for those instances, it really did help convey some sort of meaning. So it wasn't just about the calorie count or it wasn't just about the food that they were eating, but they were really able to kind of uh, contextualize that in kind of their, uh, their, their you know, everyday actual experience of, of going and, and, and eating that particular food. Um, and sharing via annotation also helped people clarify the importance of the, the data that they were that they were sharing. Um, so this was in music. Uh, if, if you like a song, you might listen to it over and over again. And you know, when before Snappy, it would just be a random screenshot or something, you know. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily put the, the captions so people couldn't tell how much I liked the song. Um, so, you know, this person was, was really saying that, you know, using that data uh, or incorporating that data kind of better helped them convey uh, uh, you know, what, what they found to be particularly, um, uh, what they were, what they were really interested in. And they helped, it helped them better convey that, you know, that was something that was really important to them and that they really liked that one particular artist. Okay. Uh, last kind of line of work that I'm, I'm going to talk through is, is much more in the clinical space. Um, so there's been a rise of technology for patient monitoring, whether it's passive diagnostics or, or journaling, different journaling techniques. Um, but a core challenge in this sort of space is that people often want to convey aspects of their experience, which data doesn't do a particularly great job of capturing. Um, so we're often reliant on kind of self-reporting and, and, and kind of conversations between uh, patients and doctors. Um, and so, so as, as one example, we really did a, we did a line of work that was understanding people's experiences with tapering of antidepressants. Um, and, and this is becoming clinic, uh, increasingly uh, clinically re recommended and desired for some patients. Um, but the process of tapering is actually quite difficult and given the potential for side effects and the need to reduce do dosages slowly and carefully. Um, and given the complexity of that process, trying to design tools to support patients and clinicians in navigating that transitory time was, was actually quite difficult. Um, and one of the things that we found in this space as well as in other spaces that is that patients often wanted to convey aspects of their lived experience uh, that had to do with their chronic health condition that really weren't particularly well recommended by others. Uh, or by, sorry, weren't well, well recommended by the, the numbers that, that you might track in this space. Um, so for example, in the case of tapering, we found that people often don't keep track uh, or patients would want to often keep track of, of how they experience different dosage changes. Um, but what was actually good or bad in the space was actually pretty subjective um, in the eyes of the patients. It wasn't as simple as measuring whether their depressive symptoms got better or worse, but also involved considering side effects, how viable that taper was in their life, and, and other different things. 
Um, so some of the things that, that we found is, uh, uh, you know, participants, people who would often go and track would uh, uh, try to figure out, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily know if a dosage change was good or bad, but they would really have to take notes to, to kind of identify or contextualize it a little bit more. Um, and what doctors who were in this space often did is, is they would uh, typically follow the guide of the patient. They would pay attention to, to what the patient was kind of saying about the lived experience of actually discontinuing one of these drugs. Uh, if they felt like they could tolerate, you know, maybe a faster taper, for example, then, then doctors would, would typically support that. Um, but, but in order to kind of bridge that communication gap between kind of the lived experience of patients and what doctors were, were kind of able to do, um, because often in this space, doctors don't necessarily have the, the expertise in these kind of difficult uh, longitudinal tapers. Uh, we thought about how we might be able to amend these kind of clinical scales that providers often give uh, to better support patients in understanding their conditions. Uh, so for example, on the left here is, is what's called the PHQ-9 or the patient health uh, questionnaire. It's a nine item questionnaire. Um, and then, you know, we, we kind of digitized a version of that, but there's lots of different versions of it that are out there. Um, and this could give the, you know, if it was digitized on, um, you know, and it's often something that's thought about in clinical literature that we could give people this really frequently and they can monitor it, uh, you know, kind of regularly as a patient is going through a process like a taper. Um, and that could kind of have impact on, on different treatment plans. Um, but we were really thinking about how could we kind of better support patients in conveying the other aspects of their lived experience beyond just what this, this sort of quantitative uh, measure might document about their lived experiences. Um, so we proposed the idea of, of uh, allowing patients to annotate these types of data. Um, maybe these questionnaires, we, they could add notes to them or add emoji or other details of, you know, where they might exper be experiencing something, that sort of thing. Um, and then that could actually be summarized um, back uh, in the, the kind of formal presentation of the clinical scales that a doctor might be reviewing. Um, so no longer is it, is it that the doctor is only reliant on that one number that kind of summarizes a patient experience, but a patient is actually uh, able to add, add a little bit more context that kind of gets embedded in that. Um, and I'll add that this is, this is all kind of hypothetical. We were, we were kind of uh, seeing whether patients would, would uh, feel like it would enable them to kind of better communicate their needs. Um, but our kind of early understanding in this space uh, suggests that, that patients thought that, that it would help them kind of add nuance. Um, I think annotations uh, add a lot more nuances to the results. Uh, I don't think I could get the entire message across without being able to say something like, yeah, I had moderate depression during week one, but my cat had just died. This is what brought down my new mood, maybe not the medication. So people really wanted to highlight these other things that were going on in their lives, which might help them better make sense of you know, that one number. So no longer was it just about the number that was being shared, but people were able to add a little bit more of this, this evidence around it. Um, so overall, what I take away from these projects is that annotation has the potential to start some of these more nuanced conversations around the significance of data. Um, in the case of Snappy, the data kind of was the annotation. What people were primarily sharing was, you know, just kind of what was going on in their everyday lives, just, you know, exactly the same way that people use social media for other purposes. But data was able to, to encourage people to, you know, talk more about their health and well-being and, and add a little bit more context to those other other things that they were sharing. Um, in the case of AT Annotator, as more of a clinical setting, um, it really was annotation of data that, that was kind of already being collected and, and clinicians are already using and already thinking about. And if we can add a little bit more of the kind of lived experience to that data that, that doctors are turning to and using to make clinical decision making, um, then I think it can do a lot of good in, in terms of representing patient experiences a little bit more. Uh, but one question that I still have that I still haven't quite wrapped my head around is in these sort of social settings, are we putting too much weight on the artifact itself, on the thing that's being shared to serve that sort of boundary role in um, uh, facilitating that sort of conversation? Are we better used in letting the data just be data and helping people, you know, have those kind of richer conversations through, you know, through other mediums outside of just, you know, the piece that's being shared between two people? Um, don't have a good answer for that. We'd love to chat about that more. All right, uh, moving forward a little bit. 
Um, so my hope is that through these research projects, I've given a bit of sense of how I think flexibility and annotation uh, can help perform, uh, can help promote more meaningful interactions with tracking technology. Um, if you've been paying attention closely, you'll notice that I left out one of those five dimensions of meaning. Um, this is resonance. This is this idea that people find meaning through kind of everyday joys and wonders. So the idea behind this at a very uh, philosophical letting, setting uh, is that people find meaning out of sunsets and other, you know, beautiful things, that, that sort of idea. Um, it's kind of hard to think about how that might show up in technology. I think somewhere in family settings might end up being a good place for doing that. Um, Lucas has been doing some, some kind of thinking in this way. Um, parents are largely introducing tracking to promote different family values, like persistence, well-being, that sort of thing. Um, sometimes they care about goal setting, but other times they're, they're trying to instill this idea that well-being can be enjoyable and something that families should work on together. Um, or maybe what, what they want to do in this space is really just have their child kind of remember those kind of bonding family moments together. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be about goal setting. It doesn't necessarily have to be about health improvement. It's just, you know, quality family time. And I think that could be a space where we're tracking can kind of help promote these sorts of ideas around resonance. Residents. Um, another space that I've been I've been really interested in, um, together with Whitney and and some others, um, is really acknowledging and kind of challenging the social social and cultural influences that end up in uh, having impact on how people derive meaning from tracking. Um, so as a couple of example, we found that in the design of food journaling apps, particularly in China, that that are designed for that audience, um, they really enforce a, an ideal body shape. Um, they they kind of follow cultural norms that exist uh, to that country and, and kind of reinforce those. Um, we've also been looking at how the design of wearables kind of encourages walking over, over other forms of physical activities and in particular other forms of physical activities that are really more commonly performed in trade work, uh, manual labor, that sort of thing. Um, and that that has class dynamics that that uh, impacts who can actually derive value and derive meaning from tracking just based on uh, the data that's actually being collected. Um, and then we've also been been noticing how uh, Western pregnancy apps that are that are oftentimes geared at fathers to be really promote this uh, ideas around ignorance of the process of pregnancy um, over uh, participating in tracking and tracking and really learning about what the process is like. Thanks, that's all I had. Time for questions. There's Stacy on Zoom. I don't know how easy it is to pull that up. Hey, can you hear me? Uh, I can. I'll repeat the question so that others can. Go ahead. Okay, great. I have a very simple one <laughs> and a selfish one. You said, I think, something like 85% of people use self-trackers. I am one of the 15%. I'm wondering if you can explain me <laughs> and yeah. people who don't use self-trackers. So what I said was that 85% of people have access to. 85% of people, you know, regularly use a, a smartphone, for example, where, you know, you can go and you can download one of these. Uh, it, is, it is not uh, that 85% of people use these sorts of devices uh, or, or, you know, regularly are tracking things about about themselves. Um, and I'd argue that that's, that's a good thing. Um, you know, we, I, I think coming, you know, having done research in this space for a long period of time, um, there's lots of reasons to be optimistic about the sorts of technology and, you know, what this technology is capable of. There's, you know, there's lots of everything from, you know, direct negative impacts as a result of this technology, you know, it bringing up uh, uh, sore feelings about, um, sore feelings isn't the right word, um, but, you know, if you, if for a variety of different reasons, like, you know, wanting to be able to continue to afford rent, for example, you, you don't have time to exercise. If that's what your, you know, device or app is continuing to kind of reinforce and highlight, um, you know, maybe, maybe tracking isn't good. You know, maybe tracking is really just causing harm and reminding you that there are all these things that you want to be doing in your life that you just don't have the bandwidth for, for whatever the reason. Um, and then for a lot of people, they use these devices and, you know, just kind of over the course of using them, uh, they, they learn what they need to and then they, and then they stop. 
And that's, you know, that's a perfectly good outcome. Lots of people will then kind of pick up tracking uh, afterwards or, you know, later on when something in their life changes that really warrants, you know, a deeper investigation. Um, and so, you know, that can be totally, you know, totally valid, totally reasonable too. Um, and so, you know, my goal through this line of work is, you know, when people are using these technologies, how can we kind of support that experience and making it more meaningful to them? Um, but I definitely don't think that everyone should be using these technologies all the time. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Sure. So going to your example of tapering medications. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I have been on SSRIs before yeah. and needed to taper, but my doctor didn't know that I could have uh, experience withdrawal symptoms if yeah. I didn't taper. Yeah. So um, I really could have used this app, <laughs> but I didn't know it. So I didn't, I don't know if you have thoughts about um, helping people find the well-designed app. Yeah. Um, so the, the tapering antidepressants project has been interesting in that um, there's really a, there's really a wide range of expertise amongst uh, clinical practitioners, doctors. Um, and in particular, antidepressants are often pres prescribed by general practitioners. So, you know, the same regular doctor that you talk, you know, that you go and talk to when you, you know, break your leg or whatever, um, is the same person who might be prescribing you antidepressants. And so, you know, what we generally find is that the more specialized a doctor is, the more kind of expertise that they have in the sort of space. Um, and so I think what we're arguing in the, the AT annotator project, and I'd love to, you know, have more clinical partnerships to kind of see this through further, um, is that for those kind of general practitioners who don't have the expertise in how to actually plan a taper and how to actually go through with it, technology can kind of give a little bit more of that guidance, can kind of introduce the process a little bit more. Um, and it, it gets a little tricky in that, you know, when you're thinking about designing technology, you don't want to take away agency or medical expertise away from that kind of clinical provider. Um, but I do think that there's there's some potential opportunity for for people who aren't super familiar with a domain like that to to um, give some suggestions. Thank you. Yeah. Melissa and then Aaron. Oh, Aaron first. Aaron. 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 Um, yeah. So thanks for the wonderful talk. Things to all of your work together in one place. Um, so I think my question is about art. Um, yeah. Which is a little weird. Um, but I think there's lots of examples here of normative and kind of inclusive design, especially like when you start talking about like your day laborers and how they like use mm -hmm. tracking apps to think about like different things. But I was wondering if there's any examples that you've encountered with tracking apps about radical design, design that might challenge the user in one way or another. And I, I can't quite imagine what that would be. So I'm asking it broadly, but you can you probably remember it tonight. Okay, so where I initially thought you were going with that question is, you know, apps that are designed to help people kind of do more self-presentation and that sort of thing. And certainly there are examples in that direction. Uh, challenging, um, trying to think there there was I mean this was a long time ago now there was this paper like a decade ago that was really trying to uh highlight how much um these sort of computational tools apps devices that sort of thing know about you and try to kind of highlight how creepy that is that they you know know everything about you just from these sorts of measures um there was this, uh, this was again, this was a while ago, but in kind of the early days of Fitbit, um, there was, uh, there were some observations that um, through activity patterns, um, and this was kind of from raw accelerometer data, this wasn't coming from, from the, the like process stuff that you or I can see. Um, Fitbit could in theory deduce, you know, when you were having sexual activity. Um, and, you know, for some people, that's really creepy. That's really weird. Uh, totally understand that. Totally reasonable. Um, so like, I think people, you know, hobbyists have kind of picked up those sorts of things as like ways of highlighting, you know, here are some of the things that these sorts of technology can do. Um, yeah, definitely, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not seeing kind of concerted efforts, but, but there definitely are people who are kind of playing around with these sorts of data for, um, you know, those purposes. Yeah. Roderick. I have a weird question also. Sure. Mm -hmm. it. Um, so I'm thinking about this vector. Thank you for the talk also. I appreciate it. I agree that it's necessarily good. 
I'm thinking about this kind of like unexplored. No, it's not a quadrant because you have five, whatever the five mm -hmm. plus mm -hmm. um, about resonance. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking like, um, I guess I'm thinking about health and like what health means with respect to health and connection self-tracking. And I wonder if the resonance like area does anything to unsettle or maybe change or make more complex what health so um, when the the uh, Meckler and Hornback who were who were kind of coming up with this framework in the first place and thinking about it in the first place, they actually took that question even larger and they thought about like is technology like holistically kind of undermining the you know opportunity for people to experience these sorts of everyday joys and wonders, and so I think. I think your question is kind of in a similar sort of vein where if you if you do get really focused on kind of the uh, behavioral and behavioral change ideals that are often tied into health and well-being, you you are inherently moving away from these sorts of ideas around resonance. Um, and so like I yeah, I've I've been a little stuck and that's why I kind of threw it at the end of my talk and said, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I'd love to chat more. I'd love to think about this more. Where like I I am a little skeptical that technology can do any good in this sort of space. And I can point to a lot of examples where technology can do bad. Um, and you know, the techno positivist in me, the optimist in me wants to think that there's something that we can do here, but still figuring it out. Okay, my, my question is even weirder than Roger. <laughs> I love it. This is great. So when you first started talking, you started talking about meaning. And yeah. it made me think of, you may not have ever read this, but Anthony Giddens has a whole work on late modernity and the idea that the fundamental thing that drives humans at an individual level is the idea that you can wake up in the morning, feel like you can handle your day. That's it. Uh -huh. I, I can just handle what's in front of me. And nothing crazy and pretty cool is going to happen and I can just do it. And he calls it ontological security, which is just the sense that I can handle what's in front of me. And I, I just wondered, like, is there something kind of fundamental about tracking that either could help or hurt or play into this idea of ontological security? Um, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, towards what you're probably alluding to, I think it cuts both ways because, you know, I can think of so many examples of tracking technology or even, you know, even just the most well informed, the most thoughtful version of a tracking technology that like under the right side of circumstances, to the answer to that question is like, no, today's going to suck. Yeah. Like, it's just going to be terrible or, or like, you know, whatever, like the bill is due tomorrow and you don't have enough in your bank. Like, you sleep? yeah, yeah. Like all these things are going to. I hate sleep technology. I don't want to yeah. know you have to sleep. Like, yeah. Sorry, yeah. It's not helpful for me. Yeah. It's, um. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to think that, you know, particularly, you know, maybe for people who are a little more pessimistic or, you know, that sort of thing, there's opportunity to try to use tracking to, you know, surface, you know, okay, all these worst case scenarios that you're worried about are, you know, actually not slated to come to be, um, or, and, you know, contextualize things a little bit more, I, you know, again optimist in me would like to think that that's the case but I but yeah I I definitely see here are all the ways where you know uh you can't do that and so um I mean track like tracking people and I think this is still this is still kind of unresolved tracking people have like constantly dealt with the tension of like how do you deliver bad news um you know I think it's been long enough that we kind of have accepted that maybe you can't or you know you you kind of just have to as as is um you know there's been all these approaches of like oh but you can frame it as more positively or that sort of thing um but yeah i think there's not just an answer to my that. question at all it's just interesting to think of yeah one way to think about it. yeah any questions from students yeah maybe <laughs> can we do like one from a student before we wrap up postdoc i'll take anything I love hearing from my colleagues, but it's not fun. Can you shoot? Go ahead. Particularly in the presentation, you were sort of talking about um, how um, when some of the participants are looking, um, I think it was for the review or something, but then looking at the data, they're 
um, something about understanding. They have used the term like they're finding meaning through understanding or reflecting on themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I think kind of reminded me because in contrast with sort of uh, the 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 expert or sort of like analytical perspective of making sense of data. And I'm sort of curious if the way you're sort of framing this, it to me it sounds like it's not not so much as making sense of data as perhaps ascribing some something to it. So, I mean, so what I think of in this space is, um, you know, whether or not it's, you know, correct or not, actually, um, people, you know, pe people turn to, you know, particularly through reflection, people turn to these sorts of apps with this kind of idea that they can better help make sense of, you know, their everyday sorts of experiences. Um, and, you know, typically, I think in tracking apps that surfaces through, you know, an app is, is, is surfacing something, you know, oftentimes through a visualization or through a written insight or something like that. Sometimes it's, it's kind of reaffirming for people things that they, they already suspected or already know. Other times it's really designed to try to deliver this new insight or this you know, insight in quotes, you know, how you define insight, I think is, uh, you know, up for discussion. But I, but I think that's kind of what both these apps are trying to go for. And I think what, you know, this idea behind coherence is, is one of the ways of meeting is, is going for. Well, we are out of time. So we're going to continue with the reception. Hopefully students cannot come up with this. <laughs> Oh, oh, there's there's no. So we are told about photographer time today and in two weeks after our, it's a drop-in, first come, first serve. I don't know how we're going to figure it out. I'm hoping that they're somewhere close by, but it's for professional headshots for anybody in the department who wants one. Even if you didn't sign up on the form ahead of time, but you're here, you want to get your photo taken. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to answer a question on Zoom. Hi. Yeah, go ahead. No, no. I, I My name is uh, Mosan Deluxe. I'm a visiting professor here. Oh, great. I'm a sociologist. Uh, uh, 